Jamma is the uh, head coach for our Raptors 905 G League squad. So if you have a question for Jamma, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, we're going to start off here with a question from Blake Murphy from The Athletic. What's up, Jamma? How are you? How are you and the family? We're doing good, Blake. Thanks, thanks for checking in. We're, uh, we're still, still enjoying our time together. Great. Glad to hear it. Um, normally, this time of year, you kind of run point on these pre-draft workouts with these guys. And obviously, there is a physical component to that where you want to see where their skill level's at. But how much do you lose in this process in terms of getting to know the person and how they respond to adversity or, or failure in a workout? Like, like how, much, how much are you missing on the person side of those pre-draft workouts right now? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And I think if you look at over the last five years, you know, doing these draft workouts was never about sort of checking their basketball skills. That's sort of something we did while they were in market and you might as well check it while they're there. But it was much more about the interpersonal and who they were and sort of getting that face to face time to get to know the, the athlete. Um, so I think, you know, our group has done an amazing job of trying to do it over Zoom as the whole world has adjusted. Um, and, some, you know, lengthy sort of Zoom calls where you're still getting some of that interpersonal sort of uh, touch. But I think it is different when you don't have the person right in front of you. And I think that's a, a, an important part of this thing. But I think we're adapting. Everyone's adapting. I mean, this draft will be different. Uh, it'll be done virtually, right? So the whole thing is going to feel a little different. But, but the, the main part of, of the, those workouts was, again, to get to know the person. And I think our group's, you know, doing a, a wonderful job of trying to make that happen. Um, I asked Patrick Engelberg this question in, in some form as well, and I, I'm curious your take as the head coach of the, the 905. With the uncertainty around the G League this year, and we, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet, um, have you found that to shift the, the discussions about, you know, the play, player X might be on this kind of timeline and this is what we've got to do to work with them? Like, like has all that hanging over it changed anything or is it just kind of we'll deal with it when it comes and we trust our, our player development system? Yeah, I mean, I think as we've gone through different versions of what these seasons could look like, both NBA and G League, like there's been different options, right? Where like teams are together, teams are apart, teams are in bubbles, like there's so many different ways to do it. And I think the strength of at least our system is that connectivity between the two groups. Um, and if we're sort of geographically separated, then that changes, you know, some things obviously. Uh, and then I think in terms of the players, that there was a discussion of, you know, what happens with player rosters? Are they going up? Are they going down? Are there going to be more of this? And, you know, more exhibit tens, more, all that sort of conversation. And it looks like we're going to stick to, to, you know, the system that we've used the last few years which means we got we got to do it really well, right? And I think as we look at our G League roster and some potential exhibit 10s and we look at undrafted people, you know, potentially, uh, and our draft picks, like that, they're, they're, we're sort of funneling them into our system. And what is that going to look like? And how do we actually start getting them a lot better once we, once we secure them into our group? Uh, so that process remains the same, right? I think, Blake, we, we really... We really look at who the athlete is. We build a plan for them in the early stages with our scouting group and with our entire sort of organization. And then the coaches sort of take it and, and, and run with it to try and get them a little bit better. Well, thanks so much, Jamma. Thanks, Blake. Next question goes to Mike Ganter from the Toronto Sun. Hey, Jamma. How are you doing? Good, Mike. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, just curious, how many drafts is this for you? You know? Oh, wow. That, yeah. well, we have to go back, Rovan. We're probably looking at uh, – I mean, we're, we're in the tens, we're in the plus tens, I'd say, yeah. for, for definitely for drafts, yeah. Now, obviously, this one's different, has, and, and obviously, your role in that you can't do the, the live workouts has changed, but has your role overall in the last couple of years changed, like this year, as opposed to uh, previous? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, in terms of my process with it, I began sort of much more in just like literally executing a workout and sort of yeah. that being full stop period. Um, that, you know, over the years, and I think even into this year, it becomes much more about some evaluation and discussion and sort of, you know, chiming in your opinion, basically on, you know, what, what do you think of them? You know, or like, how do they respond to the workout? Uh, what have you noticed? What have you heard from other coaches? I think that the more information you gather about these young athletes, the, the better chance you have to make a good decision. And I think that for me, as I've grown in my coaching career, that's sort of been a place where I can now, you know, offer some more opinion. And I've seen, you know, seen things that have gone well and gone poorly and sort of know some traits that these athletes are bringing to the table. So I think for me, Mike, that, that's been more my process. And, and I think this year specifically, um, obviously it's completely different because I, I can't touch them on the court. Um, yeah. But I think watching some film, you know, and, and, and evaluating that and just trying, to, just trying to give as much basketball input as possible. Do you, I mean, you, you spent more time on this, I'm assuming everybody has because you've had more time. Uh, but again, you're lacking the, you can't touch these guys. You can't see them or, you know, see them on a court in front of you mm -hmm. um, in person. But do you, does that lead to, are you more, more certainty or less certainty about this draft in terms of, you know, 
where you what you can get out of it and what's going to be there or is, is this is this a bigger you know a, a bigger question mark than ever I mean I mean I think this draft to a certain extent there's just a lot more sort of parity right like you're not sure on some guys irregardless but what I will say is that is that because we've had more time than we ever have for any other draft like mm -hmm. we've been at this for a long time right I mean just the timeline on some of these guys we've been they've been in our sort of on our board for a very long time um you know and I, th I think because of that you get to know every little detail about them uh you know as much as you can virtually in, in other ways so I think they're we understand them a little bit more this year, but I'm not sure if that makes the choice any easier at the end of the day. Got it. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Next, we have Doug Smith from the Toronto Star. Jim, how are you, sir? Everything good? I'm doing great, Doug. Good to hear you. Good to hear you, too. Hey, you're going to have, I guess, about a quarter of the time between draft and the start of season than you would normally, one month as opposed to, like, four. Will that factor into who you might take because – your development program in the summer is so successful, but now you don't have the summer? I think the only place it'll change, Doug, is maybe with some of our like returning rights players in the G League, um, where sometimes you're taking a look at, you know, can one of those guys be in the, in the sort of real development curve and really, you know, move the needle? I think we're going to have to, because it's a shorter timeline, you have some more established players in some of those roles um, because the thing is going to get up and running pretty quickly in terms of that, that 905 team playing. Um, so I think that it may change some of our roster decisions kind of, well, again, with returning players, older players, but I think that young group and that development system will remain pretty much as it is because I think, you know, that's, that's, it's an art form to do it. And we just got to be really now efficient, right? And literally from the day that, the, that we draft these guys or we, we select them as exhibit 10s, like we're going to go to work right away. Um, and I think we got, you know, we just got to have to, it's a, it, it's a smaller timeline, um, but we got to try and pump out the same results. And so it's, it'll be, it'll be uh, a lot of work, you know, for the group. Um, but if we have those veterans as opposed to younger people around them, that would help us, you know, speed up that process. Yeah, and just one more. What are you hearing from the players? What are they? What are their concerns about their process here? Yeah, I think you know. I think most players, and you know, you've been in touch with some of the guys that are that are you know both on the NBA side and the G League side. I think I think for the for the NBA players, it's sort of you know they've been trying to get their work in, right? And I think most of them, you know, know the system, right? Especially our older guys, and then and then and then some of the younger guys, we've been really helping them to get into a, a good plan, you know, wherever they are, and, and you know, working with them through this course of time um, so we can hit the, hit the court running. And I think for the G League players, it's definitely been a little different for them. They don't have quite the same infrastructure built in to support their growth and development. So, you know, so some guys that you talk to and they, you know, haven't really done much in a month and you're sort of, uh oh, you know, like, I, how, what are we going to do with this? Um, and I think just finding ways to, to, to get them rolling pretty quickly here is going to be really essential to both teams' success. Great. Thanks very much. Good luck the next week or so. It's going to be crazy busy. It's going to be a fun time in basketball. Thanks, Doug. Next question goes to Aaron Rose from SI.com. Hey, Jim, thanks for doing this. Um, no problem, Aaron. I'm wondering, you guys have had such success uh, developing players, and I'm wondering what characteristics you have found to kind of be the most successful when, when looking at prospects um, coming into your system. Yeah, I mean, I think the simple answer is you start with skill first, right? That's always got to be your, your starting point, right? And then you're looking at sort of, you know, the, the dimensions of the athlete, like what are they bringing to the table, you know, in terms of physicality, athleticism, explosion strength, you know, those sorts of areas. Uh, and then I think it becomes a bit more nuanced uh, in terms of who the person is. And then I think you're trying to look for some unique characteristics that they're bringing to the table. I mean, I think uh, we all know that an NBA season is a really long season, right? And it's, it's a grind more than it is a race. And I think finding people that can sort of work their way through the grind and find a way to persevere through some adversity uh, are, are things you're starting to look at in terms of qualities that, that you want to have in your system um, and players that can, that can find a way to succeed. Um, so it's definitely a multifaceted thing in terms of what you look for, right? There's a, there's a lot of factors and you're balancing things out. You're looking at your current team and, and what sort of you have in your team already that you want to add to or, or, or create more so. So each year it's a little bit different based on the makeup of the team you have coming back. Um, but overall it, it starts with skill and then you get into some of the personal stuff after that. Sure. And one more for you. Um, because of your success, you have guys like Fred who um, are hopefully probably going to make a lot of money um, this year. What is it like for you to see guys like him succeed to the point where, um, you know, they're going to cash in and make a lot of money potentially in Toronto or elsewhere? Does that kind of make you proud? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's fun to see, uh, you know, an undrafted player um, 
just work so hard, right? And I think that's why we all know Fred so well as the work that he puts in. And I think, you know, it's for him to be in a position right now where he sort of controls the marketplace is, is really great for him, right? I think it's sort of, uh, it's a testament to his work and to his effort. And I think for someone who helped him to get to a place, a place where he can probably make a few more dollars this coming season, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be part of that and, and see that grow. So super proud of him. Uh, he put the work in and we just kind of assisted him along the way. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to do a few more questions here. Uh, first one goes to Lewis Zatzman from Raptors Republic. Hey, Jim. Good to talk to you, man. It's been too long. You too, Lewis. Good to good hear from you. So um, outside of the NBA, I mean, this is a time when draft stuff is moving a lot, you know, risers fall. I know it's not the same for you guys, but because of that inability to get your hands on guys, do you find your board is a little more static leading into the actual thing? I, I think that, yeah, I mean, I think the reality for us is once we hit the draft, right, like, you know, two hours after this draft, the whole thing's going to start to go crazy in terms of, you know, G League and who's undrafted and two ways and the exhibit tens and the whole thing, right? So we're sort of, we're in a bit of a holding pattern for sure, um, but we're doing a lot of work to see what those potential options are going to be uh, so that we can move on them pretty quickly. I think that that's what makes our front office group so special is they sort of, they think ahead, right? And I think Masai's leadership to always be a step ahead and always be sort of forecasting what's going to happen so you're ready to react uh, is what we're sort of bringing to the table so a lot of sort of you know analysis and planning now that sort of potential things and then obviously like literally like you know the moment that 60th pick happens it's going to be all out you know <laughs> warfare to figure out who's left and and where they're going to end up thanks man appreciate it thanks Lewis. two more for you uh jamma first one is going to steven lung from sportsnet hey jamma it's good to see you good to hear your voice you as well you as well um, I was just wondering, uh, just as, as, as far as like the, like the draft process goes, you, you mentioned how like a lot of Zoom interviews, a, a, lot, of, a lot of like Zoom process, um, does that change anything when, when, when speaking to prospects, like, like, uh, like as opposed to seeing them in person, like in terms of getting to know their personality and, and like who they are as, as human beings? Uh, I mean, I think, I think we're, we've all sort of adjusted, to be honest, right? I think we're all doing Zoom calls every single day, all the time. And I think we've all figured out how to, how to make them work, right? So I think for our group, I think we feel pretty confident that, that our process has been good to understand who these people are. I think sometimes Zoom, you can even, you can even really focus on that person even more, right? You, you spotlight them and that's it. You know, there's no distractions in the room. There's nothing else happening. So you can really get a feel for them directly sometimes, even maybe more so, because it's such a sort of one-on-one -on -one sort of, I guess, type scenario, even though you might have other people on the call. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we've adjusted, right? I mean, shoot, all of, all of us have adjusted to, 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 to figure out how to, how to move forward. So I think we feel confident that we know them, um, you know, and now we're going to see where the, where the chips fall and who's available. And, you know, you see where you go from there. Thanks a lot, Gemma. Stay well. Thank you. 